Amen. Great prayer. Well, wow. so, so precious. Thank you, Jesus. I really believe that as we hear the prayer and, and listen to the Spirit speak to our hearts that all, all kinds of great things happen in our understanding. Sometimes emotionally, I get released. I come with a heavy heart and I listen and the Spirit speaks to my inner man and I trust and worship. Uh, I also believe that as I listen, my body could be healed. I think in Psalm 103, I know in Psalm 103 that he heals us of many diseases. And that is also such a precious truth. Uh, tonight I'd like to speak about Deborah from the book of Judges. Yay, Deborah, finally we get to hear about a woman and a great woman. And we have many of them here in our church and throughout the world. Women of God, women of faith, and Deborah in Judges chapter 4. And then we read also in chapter 5 her song of victory. Uh, I, behind the story is some deep theological truth that needs to be explained. So this was part of the message. And then the history of the story, another diagram just generally about where this took place in Israel. We have, the, we have Israel that looks like this. We have the Sea of Galilee. You have the Jordan and we have the Dead Sea. Uh, at this time in their history, uh, the Jews have taken care of a lot of the Canaanites down in the south. If you took a look at Judge, uh, Judges chapter 4, we have uh, the verse 1. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. We'll go back to this picture in a minute. But I... You, a month ago, or, or even longer, we drew a very simple diagram of the culture leading people in a direction, like in the United States. When the Canaanites were in the land that was promised to Israel, they inhabited it, and they were entrenched. And the Jews were told by God not to marry Canaanite women and not to interact with them with the people or combine the culture of Jew and Canaanite. But they were to be driven out or killed. If they don't leave, you kill them. Or otherwise, they will be thorns in your eyes. Uh, so we drew the diagram that the Canaanite culture is moving the people this way and that God has a counter movement and that is this way. And uh, the, the point is that one is ungodly and the other one is spiritual. One is ungodly, but the other one is led by the Holy Spirit. And it, there were times when this force here, this one, was, was weak. And the people just sent simply, the Jewish people simply they synchronized with the culture and became idolaters also. They would worship the Canaanite gods because there was a temptation by their nature to be like the Canaanite people. Because then you could commit promiscuous sex, um, you could worship things like stones and rocks and mountains and rivers that would never contest your sin nature. But you could worship them in a form, in a religious form, but there would be no real change in you, and actually you don't want any real change in you. You just want to live a sinful life. This is the temptation of the Canaanite people. Uh, but when, when you live a sinful life, you get weary, tired, 
Proverbs 13, 15, the way of the transgressor is hard. Most of you have done that, if not all of you. You have found the vanity of it, the emptiness of it, the shallowness of it, the disappointment of it, and the pain of it. The fear, too. Um, perhaps if I die, I would go to hell. That's a very convincing argument for me to say, wait a minute, is there another message? Is there another God? Is there a true God, a real God that would satisfy? And so we have this uh, office, the judge or the, the, the leader, he was not a king exactly, but he was similar because he had judicial power, he had military power, he had legislative power. He was the, the leader of the nation. And when God raised up a judge, he was able to contest the enemy. And, and, and they were oppressed, the Jews were oppressed, and uh, but then there was the courage and the leadership and the spirit moving in the judge, and he was able to deliver the people from the oppression, and that was political and military oppression. They were, the Jews would, here's a road, let's just say, you know, a main road, 95 north, and the Jews wouldn't go on that road. They would go on the side roads, so they didn't meet any Philistines or Canaanites. Because if they met them, their, their life was in danger. Their possessions would be taken from them, their food, their crops. They were oppressed. So when, when they were oppressed, they would cry out to God. And God would raise up somebody who would contest heroically and do battle against the, we can call it, the the, the direction of the demonic and natural nature of the people. In Deborah's case, she was used this way. She rose up with a, a man by the name of Barak, Deborah, which means honeybee, a bee, yeah, a honeybee, and then Barak, and he was the man but Deborah prophesied that this military victory that we will have over this general, Sisera, that this will be done by a woman. And she really wasn't speaking about herself. She was talking about a, a woman that lived in the north. Uh, so there's a little historical detail here. And here's our picture. They're up in this area. This is Mount Tabor. And there was Barak that called the Jews to battle against a army that was coming in this direction. They came down from the north. The Jews are the Jews are doing well in the south, but there's oppression in the north. And there is this king there, Jabin, and he's entrenched, and he has a general general Sisera. And this man, Sisera, is going to wipe out the Jews. And Bar Barak raised up an army of 10,000. They come to Mount Tabor, and they circle the enemy this way. They do battle. The enemy flees. There's a rainstorm with a river that over floods, floods here. They have 900 chariots of iron. They get stuck in the mud. There's the rain coming down hard and strong that they said came from God, and that God did battle on their behalf. They got stuck in the mud, they couldn't escape, and the Jews slaughtered them. That was the way the battle went, a real battle that represents something important to us. The general escapes, he goes north here, he goes up here, and there's a woman there in a tent, and, and she's from a tribe over here, the Kenites, and Moses was married into this tribe. Moses had a wife 
from this tribe, and they were, they were not strictly speaking enemies of Israel, but this is where this woman was that was living in the, the, with, with her people. And probably she did not know it, and this general that is escaping on foot, he's running up there, and she meets him at the tent and says, come on in. Are you tired? Come on in. I will serve you. Come on in. This is hospitality time. So he comes in exhausted from a whole day of battle, and he lies down, but she gives him yogurt or milk in a lordly dish, and he falls asleep, probably filled with the milk and fully exhausted, falls asleep. She takes a tent peg, which is about a foot long, sharp on one end, and while he is sleeping, she drives the peg through his skull, through the temple, the softer part of the bone structure. The, the spike goes through his head, and he's nailed to the ground. And he's a general who was in charge of this battle. And Deborah's prophecy was accurate. It would be a woman that would really, would really win the day, win the battle. And this is the story in these two chapters, four and five. And there are a number of lessons in it. This is the gist of the story and the, some of the detail. So I would like to back up and think about this, this uh, story and how it relates to us. I would like you to think about our country and which way our culture is going, what is being said to us day and night, what is being taught by our leaders, our judges, what is being in, embraced by in a political world, in an educational world, in the um, all branches, all institutions of our nation. And I think in a word, we could just say it is, it is in a word, it is immorality. I believe this is really what is being pushed, immorality. I don't think it's a surprise. I think we understand it. We see it everywhere. It's in the movies, it's in the school, it's in the curriculums, it's being taught to kindergartners, to small young people. There is a whole mentality of immorality. And it is surprising how it is succeeding, how it is happening. And eventually it will take on a form, I believe, and it will attack us. Eventually, we are the oppressed ones. We are the ones that are the problem. We are the ones that are not cooperating. Maybe, I could be overreacting, but I think you get the idea. There is the Canaanite culture here in the West, and then there is the Spirit of God that is moving in a different direction. This is the place where two seas meet. This is the place where Christ comes into the world at Bethlehem, where Herod has one agenda, God has another one. We are not afraid of it. We are actually fascinated by it. And like in the story of Deborah, we are aroused by the contest. And that's the beauty of this woman that she not only had power, but she had the influence, she had the Holy Spirit. And by the way, she reigned for 40 years. And with this victory, for 40 years, there was peace in Israel. She did an amazing job. The value of one person who has conviction, the value of one group of people that are spirit-led, the value of a group of people that say, deep, all the way down to our toes. No, I don't like that. 
I don't agree with that. I don't want that. That's not what I'm interested in. So in some countries, they have been very moral in a way of, of uh, common morality in the communist world. Uh, the pornography was illegal. Prostitution was illegal in the communist world. It was very interesting. They believed that a moral population was, in, was important in this sense, this ideological way, but not believing in God, strangely enough. It is interesting how these combinations of ideologies happen. And today in the liberal world, they're linking up with the Islamic people, which is a strange bedfellow. But we don't know how this will unfold in our country, but we can be sure there is one thing that the devil recognizes, one thing that the devil cannot handle, and that is people that are hearing from God, hearing from him in their heart, and receiving it, and embracing it, and then sharing it. I believe, therefore, have I spoken, David said. And it happens when we really believe we cannot help but meaning you, you just like a troubled fountain. It's just water still comes out. It just still comes out. You can't stop what is in the heart when the Holy Spirit puts it in our hearts. So, um, I'd like you to turn to um, Luke 11. This would be a really long message if I told you everything that I wanted to. But, I, but just hit, hitting a couple things. Luke 11, and this is very... Uh, before Luke 11, go to John 8. <laughs> okay, John 8. <laughs> okay, here we are. And it, 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 follow it with me. John 8, he said, verse 23. He said unto them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Uh, say that to your neighbor, would you? I am from above, you are fr of this world, I am not of this world. That's, that's, that's funny. You are from beneath, I am from above, I am not of this world, okay. Now go to Luke 11, please. Luke 11. I want you to see something before you, we read it. Here is the earth with Adam and Eve. Do you know what the world would have been if Adam and Eve had not sinned? If they had not sinned, do you know what the world would have been? Anybody here? Yeah, okay. Uh, heaven, paradise, population without sin, Christ and, Christ and people, heaven on earth. We we believe that this is how he made it in the beginning with this intention. Why do we believe that? Because at the end of the Bible, that's what happens. God comes here on the earth. In the future, that day will come, and this world will be glorified, perfected. But the world became something else, and you know what that is? Yes. But, but it, it is a very powerful thing that people generally don't understand. 
The world is very different from what God intended it. It is very different from what, where he was going with it. He did not make it so that we would be sweating, we would be dying, we would have disease, we would be frustrated. He did not make it so we'd be killing our brother Abel or be getting, having pain, uh, burying our loved ones. He did not make it this way that there would be lying and cheating and deceit and treachery. He did not make it that way. But that is the world that we've been born into. But also in this world, we see glimpses of God. Lord, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? I look at the hills. From whence cometh from my help? My help cometh from the Lord. So in the hills, I can see the Lord, Psalm 122. I also see God in a baby's face, the face of a child. I think God made children so that we'd be reminded of what we are made for. And he said it in Matthew 18, that let them come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. I think a child, it's a beautiful expression of the way he intended people to be, that they would be gentle, happy, fun-loving, optimistic, trusting, impressionable, teachable, easily led and guided. And for a whole world of, of people to be this way would be an amazing thing, and one day it is coming, but even greater than just being like childlike like that. So what is this world anyway? How dark is it? Look at Luke 11, verse 21. <clears throat> when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Now, go back to the previous verse. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed, who is that? When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger, who is that? Then he shall come upon him and overcome him. He takes from him all his armor. What is that? Wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Let's go back and read it, and I'll tell you what I believe about this. Verse 21, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, that is the devil. That is the devil. He is a strong man, and he is armed and he keeps the palace in peace. He keeps the palace, he's got power, and his territory, which is, let's look at the world here, here's his palace. This is the devil's palace, high walls, fortification. This is the devil has a palace. The devil has people captive. You might say, oh, pastor, what do you mean? We are captive to, no, I, I'll explain it to you. There are people that are captive to the devil, and of course they don't know that. In the same way a fish is in an aquarium, and he doesn't know like what's going on. But for him, this is normal. That's all. It's like a lion in a, in a forest, in a reserve, and everybody knows his name. He's tagged, satellites track him, everybody knows about the lion in the forest, and the lion thinks he's free, but actually, in fact, he, he, there is a stronger man than him that is guarding the palace, and, and his goods are in peace. This is the devil and the human race. And we might say, well, wait a minute. I have a good time at the picnic. I like the ocean. I have, my family loves me. Wait a minute, I'm in, I'm in bondage under the, 
the prince of the power of the air. Yeah, go back to this picture here, and it is this one. Which part of that diagram, where do you flow? What's your flow? Are you believing a lie? Are you, are you and I, by nature, we are subject to the strong man until the stronger than he comes. The stronger than he, there's only one, and that is Christ. And he comes and he takes and binds the strong man and saves us, translates us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now in the kingdom of his dear son, we are gathered here with the Holy Spirit. And Christ is the head of the body. And we are not in the devil's palace. Now just think of a palace, huge high walls, people are inside, moving around, and they're lying to each other. They're saying, what a beautiful day in the palace today. Isn't it great to be here? Isn't it great to be alive? I'm going down to the park today. So they trot down to the park inside the palace, and they play ball, and they say, isn't this wonderful? But Christ says, let me ask you a question. You are from beneath. I am from above. If you live in sin, you're in the bondage of sin. But I came so that you could be set free from sin. That sin would not have dominion over you. I came so that you would be free indeed. That it, you wouldn't be in some palace with high walls. You would be able to fly from one planet to another in the kingdom of Christ where there is a, a power and authority over sin. The problem in this picture here is that we go, we join the crowd with the sin and we do it by nature. This is where the church is must be deeply concerned. The church should be deeply concerned about its convictions on some of these moral issues. You cannot sleep with another woman unless you are married to her. You cannot sleep with another man unless you are married to her. Otherwise, it is adultery. It is fornication. It is sin, it is sin period. Christ says it. God says it. Ten Commandments say it. Leviticus 18, 22. If a man sleeps with another man, it's an abomination. Any doubt about that? Romans 1, 27. Any question about it? No question about it. It, it. We do not embrace it. We do not reinforce it. We are not party to it. Romans 1, 31. They, those that do such things not only do them, but have pleasure in them that do them. There's a big party called Gay Pride Party or whatever. They have a big party about immorality. They rejoice in it. They embrace it. They push it. It is empowered by the spirit that is in this world. That does not, it is not the spirit of God. It is the spirit of the world. And it's powerful. And Christians find themselves going along because they accommodate and go back to the story of uh, Deborah and read a couple of verses and she's angry because they needed support in the battle. Deborah says in verse 16 of chapter 5, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. It means, I called you guys to battle. Barak called you to battle. Reuben, where were you? You were watching your flocks. You were listening to the bleeding of the sheep. When we needed you in a battle, you were not there. When we needed your presence, you didn't join ranks. And because we won without you, there's great searchings of heart. You're home searching your heart, wondering why didn't we go? 
Why weren't we part of the solution? Why didn't we? We didn't know there would be a victory. We were afraid there would be a defeat. So we stayed home. And so Deborah is in her song mentioning these tribes. The next one is verse 17. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Those tribes, where were they? They remained on the ships because it's safe. They stayed at home in their place. They didn't know what the outcome would be. They needed the courage. They needed the Holy Spirit. Look at the diagram. I do not care if you and I, I'm saying this as a preacher and saying it with you, if we are alone, we will go. If we are slaughtered, we will go. If we are ridiculed, we will go. If we lose, we will go. This is the nature of the battle that Christ is calling us to. He's saying there's a very strong man that is in charge of this house called the world. And you, brothers and sisters, listen, it is real. This is spiritual warfare. This is the same as Nazism, same as communism. In the United States, we don't have the communism or the Nazism that is taking the power, but we have immorality with the people going wholesale, believing this is the life I want. I can go anywhere, do whatever, sleep with anybody, have any kind of sexuality. It is my right, it is my privilege, it is what is guaranteed me, it is mine. Let's go for it all the way and have a huge party and celebration and ridicule those strange, old-fashioned people. But you know, if they really knew us, they would be jealous of our freedom, of our joy, of our peace. We, we, are, we are people, we, we are people, we may not have great weapons, but you know what this woman did? She gave him yogurt. She gave him milk that was curdled, Arabic yogurt. And in the Bible, we know that milk represents the Bible in 1 Peter 2.2. And when you meditate on it, and it kind of cooks a little bit, it curdles. And I'm just saying by way of typology, this woman had some resources. She also said she gave him butter in a lordly dish. And we read Job 29, that God washed Job's feet with butter when he was walking so close to God. And butter is also that, that milk, milk that is moving, 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 and something happens in the chemistry of it, and it changes and becomes butter. Well, our meditation. And what did she attack? The man's head. What did she put the tent peg through? And tent peg in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is also referred to as the word of God. Let, let's read it just because it sounds me it sounds incredible and then I'm making it up just to just to have a good message here. Listen, verse chapter twelve, verse eleven. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. Let me repeat it. The words of the wise. Is this what this woman had? She had milk from the meditation of the word. She had a tent peg, which is like the words of the wise that are fastened, that you can fasten a tent to the ground with a tent peg. And this tent peg goes through, may, may we say it? Sure. It goes through the devil's mind. It goes through the enemy's mind. Our words. Our debate, our argument, our defense, our wisdom, our way of life, how we raise our kids or would like to, how we fellowship with each other, how we counsel each other in Christ. Depth, a woman. Well, us men feel a little bit ashamed. Us power, these power, power guys up here. 
I think we need to bring some women up here. <laughs> uh, listen, what does that mean? Could be a child. Psalm 8, out of the mouth of children, God has perfected praise. That a child may know better than an adult. A woman who has the mind of Christ and has the tool is able to do a victory. Reuben, where were you? Dan, why were you hanging out in your ships far from the battle? What was wrong with you? This is what she's saying. She is, in a way, ridiculing them. And then verse uh, 18, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that were jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. They fought in the battle. The river of Kishon, that was where I told you about the storm and the overflowing river, it swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horses broken by the means of prancings, the prancings of the mighty ones. Then, the, verse 23, curse ye morose, another group said of the angel of the Lord, curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall jail, that's the woman that did it, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be blessed, she will be blessed above women in the tent. He asked water, she gave him milk, she brought forth butter in a lordly dish. Verse 26, she put her hand to the nail in her right hand to the workman's hammer. With the hammer she smote Sisera, this general. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down at her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed there he fell down dead. Graphic. What's the point? I expect from you, by God's grace, to have conviction and go against the tithe. I expect you and me, by God's grace, and listen, we are feeble folk, but we are mighty. We dwell in the rocks. We are, we are like a small, godly woman, and, and in the story, she really didn't realize it doesn't explain because she wasn't really Jewish and wasn't really connected, but it was the Holy Spirit that had her do this and, uh, and it delivered the nation. And I just want to say, I think this world is under a lot more influence than people realize that there is a palace and the part that got me the other night in the meditation was he has it in peace. The devil loves to have it all knit, all packaged, all tidy, tightened up, all the doors locked, everything, and he's just at peace. Nobody is contesting him. Nobody has the power on the inside of the palace. Nobody can overtake the devil. He is strong, and he's got all his stuff secure, and it's in peace. But Christ said, I am not from here. I am from above. And I am stronger than him. And I take his armor. And I was thinking, what's the armor of the devil? I take his lies, and I break them in pieces. I, I take his threats, and I don't care. I die, I die, but I will not die. I will die in the Lord. In other words, he takes the armor, the threat of death, the accusation, the world of temptation. And Christ said, I have overcome the mighty one, and I take his armor. And it is no armor. It is no power over us. We are greater than him. We are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We are the answer for our community. We are the messengers of nothing less than God himself in this dark world. I appreciate it. I feel tonight you are serious. That's how I feel about the church tonight. I feel that you like to listen to this. 
and I feel like you like to get a hold of it, and you like to say, tell me, I want to be different. I do. I want to be there. I want to be like Christ in this world and help me become like him. That's what we're like saying to each other. Help me. Guys, help me. Help me. Help me. I see it in you. And I mean, not intentionally, deliberately like that. But we help each other because we are here. We help each other because we've got the truth and the meditation. We help each other because we've got a tent peg in our hands and we're ready to do battle. We got here and we can take that tent peg and put it right through the television. <laughs> except, you know, except, except when AD is on. Okay, TV series, okay. And other godly programs that may be edifying for you. We put the tent peg through the lie. We put the tent peg through the accusation, through the temptation. Let it be what it is. But Christ came and did great battle, and he is alive tonight, and he's on our side. We are on his side, and we are, we are, we are serious about it, and we have to be. There will be a time when you will be tempted to do something very stupid, and you will do it. But God is too big. He is greater than our stupidity. There will be a time when you'll be disappointed with yourself. Take it, eat it, you're disappointed, and then wake up and know a greater than the strong man has overcome the strong man and has established a kingdom on the earth, and you are in it. And he translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And in that kingdom are plenty of provision, plenty of words, plenty of meditation, plenty of the Holy Spirit, plenty of divine purpose, and plenty of instruction that comes from God for us hurting people. We are well able. And Deborah will say, come on, come on. Deborah will say, come on, come on, let's go. Some will hold back. Curse you, morose. Daniel, why are you hanging out on your ships? Gilead, where were you when we needed you? Come on, let's go. We're going to go anyway. But come on, enjoy it. It's a lot of fun because God is with us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. Christianity is the health of the nation. What if every Christian man, God, God's man, woman, child, everybody would stand up and say no? I mean, this is what I think. This is how I live. And we not stood up by verbally necessarily, but in our hearts, we're going to live a godly way. While the world is going to hell, we are going to live a godly way and save some. Save some. Share the message. Love them. For, pray, tell them they are forgiven through Christ. Accept Christ, you are forgiven. Okay, pray with me. Here we go. You're here tonight, and you don't have Jesus. Tonight is your night. Tonight is a big night for you. Tonight is a big night to say yes to Christ. You have no answer for this world. Nobody knows the real answer, only Christ. Nobody knows what's really going on, only Christ and his word. God cares about you. You need him. And say Jesus Christ, I trust you. I need you. I trust you. There's no king that would die on a cross for me but you. I trust you. Save me. And then teach me your way. Guide me. I, I want to be free from sin. I sin, but not like I used to now. That happens, and we confess it, and we move on in faith and in grace. And grace teaches us not to sin. We have greater power than sin. We have a new birth. We have a new nature. Would you raise your hand if you're saying the prayer, Jesus, save me. Anyone at all? Raise your hand. Anyone? Raise your hand. Yes, to Jesus. There's a hand over there. Thank you. God bless you. That's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. And then for each of us tonight, may we be determined to be part of this great expression of God on the earth.
in these dark times. This is an evil nation. We love our nation, but it is an evil nation, Paul said. But we are born from above, and now we, are, we have a message for the people around us and, and bless us.